different races, classes, religions, and colors on fundamental social and economic objectives. Be it resolved that we, these men and women assembled here this morning in the Good Samaritan Hall in Port of Spain, proclaim the establishment of such a party, democratic, cutting across race, creed, and color. End of quote. This was part of a motion passed by Dr. Eric Williams on the 24th of January, 1956, that gave birth to a new political party, the People's National Movement. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be invited by the Dr. Eric Williams Memorial Committee to speak to you tonight. I am not here to praise or demonize Dr. Williams. I come to give you facts. I come here to question myths, and I want you to be the judge. The quote I read reflects the ideology. It reflects the ideology of the PNM and Eric Williams in 1956. But was it always so? Some would disagree. In November 1954, an article entitled, Dr. Eric Williams, is he a propagandist? Was published in the Clarion, a working class newspaper. The anonymous author was critical of a public lecture delivered by Williams, who accused Indo Trinidadians, Indians in Trinidad and Tobago, of opposing federation due to racial prejudices. It seemed that Williams had used the Indian factor as a scapegoat and did not understand the real reason for the general lack of interest in federation. In a defensive tone, the author of the article referred to Williams as an intellectual snob and argued, I quote, Indians have always been in the forefront of the struggle against imperialism and colonialism wherever they have gone, and Trinidad is no exception. There can be no fear of Indians not integrating with the other races here. End of quote. This supposedly anti-Indian view of Williams did not always prevail. In August 1955, at a lecture at his favorite ground, his stomping ground, the Woodford Square, the lecture was entitled Historical Background of Race Relations in the Caribbean. And Williams identified the cause of the race problem as being imperialism and economic in nature. He added that the racial problems in the Caribbean stem from one group attempting to dominate the other. Williams deemed it necessary that the rights of others be respected and a climate of harmony be created to ensure religious and racial groups felt secure. Three years later, in 1958, the PNM was defeated in the federal elections. The doctor, who was leader of the PNM, penned an article entitled, The Danger Facing Trinidad and Tobago and the West Indian Nation. It was published in his party's newspaper, the PNM Weekly, which was later renamed The Nation. He wrote, and I quote, PNM's decimation in areas with an overwhelming preponderance of Indian votes reflects the DLP campaign and the DLP's appeal that Indians should vote for DLP so as to ensure an Indian governor and an Indian prime minister. Religion figured prominently in their campaign. The Indian nation is in India. It is a respectable, reputable nation. It would repudiate any such divisive attempts as are being made in Trinidad. End of quote. 
Williams was bitter and hurt after that election defeat. And he referred in that article, listen to this, the recalcitrant and hostile minority of the West Indian nation masquerading as the Indian nation and prostituting the name of India for its selfish reactionary political ideals, end of quote. Williams would also express similar sentiments to a large crowd at the University of Woodford Square. And one person who was in attendance, Dr. Winston Mahabe, an Indo-Trinidadian and member of the PNM, was in attendance with his wife and both were horrified. Mahabe in his autobiography noted that William's speech, and I quote, contained generous ingredients of abuse of the Indian community, which was deemed to be a hostile and recalcitrant minority. The Indian community represented the greatest danger facing the country. It was an impediment to West Indian progress. It had caused the PNM to lose the federal elections. There were savagely contemptuous references to the Indian illiterates of the country areas who were threatening to submerge the masses whom Williams had enlightened. End of quote. Some of you all might think we talk about 2015, huh? <laughs> Many of us still remember those words hostile and recalcitrant minority. The speech by Williams have often been used by persons as proof that the father of the nation did not treat all races equally. It seemed like a blunder. Professor Brinsley Samaru believed that many Indians had never forgiven Eric Williams for making this statement. More than 50 years later, we still hear those words being used in talk shows and the radio. The words continue to haunt us. But what was Williams trying to do? He was trying to give priority to nationality rather than ethnicity or race. The statement by Williams was aimed at those who did not support him. He was only human. It was a human reaction. And it should not be interpreted that the PNM was completely anti-Indian. In fact, a considerable number of Indians belonging to the Islamic faith, particularly those in the South St. Joseph area, were staunch supporters of the PNM. And this was partly attributed to the influence of Kamal bin Mohammed, a government minister and a parliamentary representative of the PNM. It was no surprise that the nation, William's paper, published Ramadan greetings and Eid messages. In addition to the support of Muslims, many Christian Indians supported the PNM in the 1950s 1960s and 70s and in the 1980s. In 1958, Williams boasted of the solidly interracial face of his party's legislative team that had two mayors and ministers of Indian ancestry, one parliamentary secretary and one federal legislator of Chinese ancestry. And Williams wrote, and I quote, it is better a hundred times for them to have lost on the PNM ticket of interracial solidarity than to have won on the DLP ticket of racial chauvinism. End of quote. During the 1950s and 60s, the PNM sought to improve its image of being representative of all citizens. And this was achieved through the pages of the party's newspaper, The Nation. There were articles, regular articles and reports on India and Indians. For instance, in 1959, there was a full page article by Eric Williams on Mohandas Gandhi of India to mark the 90th anniversary of Gandhi's birth. 
The nation also reported in 1959 that the Director of Government of Indian Tourist Services had visited Trinidad. In January 1962, a newspaper published an India Republic Day supplement with pictures of Jaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi. During 1968 and 1969, there were regular articles on Indira and Mahatma Gandhi. The visit of Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India to Trinidad, was another milestone, and it also indicated an attempt by Williams to transcend this deep racial barrier. Williams also gained some degree of political mileage by his decision that Trinidad and Tobago should be the second country, Barbados was the first, in the Commonwealth Caribbean to recognize the independence of Bangladesh, an Indian populated state on the Asian continent. Williams was also very cautious in becoming entangled in nearby Guyana where there was a deep division between Indo-Guyanese and Afro-Guyanese. But how did Williams portray Trinidad and Tobago abroad? In June 1962, at a dinner in Israel, Williams compared Israel and Trinidad and Tobago, and he said, I quote, we have both sprung from humble origins. We both stand for equality of opportunity for all the peoples within our dominion. End of quote. In 1964, at the University of Dakar in Senegal in Africa, Williams described Trinidad as Afro-Asian on a European base. This hostile and recalcitrant minority were not limited to persons who did not support the BNM. Selwyn Ryan noted that Williams was often a stern critic of the PNM and complained of the corruption, nepotism, factionalism, and individualism that strangled the party. Williams complained of the political immaturity, complacency, and gross absenteeism of some PNM representatives. Furthermore, Anyone within the PNM who disagreed with the doc was put in the political doghouse. These included members such as Ian R. Robinson, Carl Hudson Phillips, Hector McLean, and Patrick Solomon. Many persons continue to question the supposedly equal treatment of Dr. Eric Williams to citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. In 1996, at a conference at UWE, Dr. Kenneth Parmesan, a black power activist and a history lecturer, argued that for Williams, recalcitrant meant any person or group who went against the grain of what he perceived to be the working out of his nationalist project. Parmesan noted that creolization was the main agenda of Williams, and he, Williams was very concerned in achieving this nationalist agenda. The Roman Catholic Church also came under fire from Williams and the PNM. The Roman Catholic Church was against Williams for his stance against denominational schools and his support of birth control. Colin Palmer, in his 2006 bio biographical study of Williams, revealed that Williams opposed the teaching of Hindi in the schools, and that Williams wondered whether the teaching of Hindi might not lead to requests for the introduction of African languages. Before you judge Williams as being anti-Hindu, I want us to revisit a public lecture that the doc made at Woodford Square on the 13th of September, 1955, and it is entitled, The Case for Party Politics in Trinidad and Tobago. And I quote, I can show you in PNM a Hindu official who has done more to stimulate social consciousness among the depressed groups than most people of his generation. That is the PNM. 
It has added a new dimension to our political and social life. A Hindu organization, the Sunarine Dharam Sabha, approached the PNM for information on its policy and program. End of quote. Furthermore, William sought to remove the ignorance from some of his supporters. And I want you to listen to this, a very important quotation. It is a crime against PNM, treason to the national community for PNM supporters to sneer as some did a few days ago on Wrights Road and Indians wearing Balize shirts. I call upon all party members to stop once and for all this infuriating nonsense that every Indian is anti-PNM. Every Indian is not anti-PNM, nor is every white. Some of the worst enemies of the PNM are as black as the ace of space. End of quote. A very nice quotation, a very nice quotation by the doc. And it shows you his ideology. It shows you he was a very idealistic person. But don't get it vexed, huh? <laughs> Certain questions remain unanswered. Who did the ethnic minorities support? These minorities included persons of British, Chinese, Syrian Lebanese, Irish, and Portuguese Jewish descent. Some would know the family history of Eric Williams. Some would know the fact that he was a member of a black French Creole family who he felt was alienated by the white side of the family. Did the local wealthy French Creoles support the PNM? Williams wrote in one of his articles, listen to this, a very short sentence, I quote, I can show you in PNM a white businessman whom PNM owes money that it has not yet repaid. End of quote. So this is the kind of financing that Williams attracted and it would cut across these, these racial barriers. It is interesting that the ethnic minorities were not lumped together as hostile and recalcitrant. And for Williams, they seem to have fitted in well with the nationalist agenda. In 1962, at the state opening of the first parliament in Trinidad and Tobago on the 31st of August, 1962, Williams gave an address, which again was all embracing and showed that he accepted all citizens. And listen to what he said, and I quote, we pledge ourselves to fulfill the promise expected of us, not only by Her Majesty, but by all nations of the world, to show our small community with its people drawn from many lands of diverse racial origins and subscribing to a variety of religious beliefs can in harmonious cooperation make its contribution to the sum total of world peace, world progress, and world happiness." End of quote. So this was William at a turning point in our nation's history, mentioning about the races and religions, and saying to the world that we are going to create happiness and peace. We are going to contribute to world peace and happiness. Calypsonians, some of the Calypsonians, they sought to get the duck a little vexed during Calypso time, and some felt the heat, eh? and they were also considered hostile and recalcitrant, including Chokdas. <laughs> but some Calypsonians portrayed Eric Williams as someone who accepted all citizens. Someone who treated everyone equally. Someone who the citizens could depend on. And I want to quote from a relatively unknown Calypsonian known as the Mighty Striker. Listen to this, this few lines, one of his verses. Annabella stuck in one patching. She wanted doctor to help that. 
Johnson trousers falling. He want the doctor to help with that. Dorothy Louis Shiman, she want to complain to Dr. Williams. These are some verses, and you would see it in other verses too, other lyrics in the Calypsonians, where it gave the image of Williams as not simply someone who was charismatic and enigmatic and an intellectual, but somebody who the citizens could depend on, somebody who they could rely on to satisfy their psychological needs, their material needs, financial needs. This is what Williams was to, to many people. There was a class in society, a group in society, who opposed Williams. And Williams would have certainly seen them as hostile and recalcitrant. And this group were the trade unions. This group, the trade unions, even today they seem to give some problems. In his early political career, Williams was a speaker and advisor for various workers and trade unions. He spoke to the fishermen, the steel band men, laborers, stevedores, those in the coconut industries. Williams had links with the labor movement, but he encouraged no political accommodation with these trade unions. He steered clear of any political association that had occurred in other islands like Jamaica and Barbados. He understood the dangers of courting the major unions in the sugar and oil industries that had different ethnic bases. He avoided political power sharing with the unions. And this enabled the PM to extend its appeal to all sectors in society, inclusive of the growing middle class. He had a broad-based electoral support. But there were also Afro-based trade unions, which Williams knew he could depend on their support. Unions like the Oil Fields Workers Trade Union, the Communication Workers Union, the Seamen and Waterfront Workers Trade Union, they were the strength of his party. From 1960 to 1964, there were at least 230 strikes involving 75,000 workers from the sugar and oil industries. And do you know that many people believe that Williams failed to assist the working class because they see these strikes as reflecting on an inadequacy of Eric Williams. For many in the working class, political independence still meant economic oppression and injustice. But how did Williams respond to these disturbances in the 1960s? He did it through legislative means. He passed the Industrial Stabilization Act on the 18th of March, 1965. The act canceled the right of unions to take strike action. And he was accused by the unions of being dictatorial. This ISA, the Industrial Stabilization Act, crippled the unions. Williams rode a very dangerous trail. The power of the unions to represent the working class was now placed in the hands of an industrial court that was established in 1965. Trade unions continued their relentless opposition to the ISA, and in 1972, it was replaced by the Industrial Relations Act which only made cosmetic changes to the ISA, but returned unions to a limited right to strike, possibly when negotiations have broken down. Most of the trade unions in the 1960s and 1970s viewed the Williams regime as anti-labor, anti-working class. Williams would have certainly dis viewed these disruptive elements as hostile and recalcitrant. But why were these unions protesting? It was the same old reason. Low salaries, long hours of work, poor safety conditions, poor health conditions, and unfair negotiations.